The Russian Revolution by Rosa Luxemburg. Chapter 1. Fundamental Significance of the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution is the mightiest event of the World War. Its outbreak, its unexampled radicalism, its enduring consequences constitute the clearest condemnation of the lying phrases which official social democracy so zealously supplied at the beginning of the war as an ideological cover for German imperialism's campaign of conquest. I refer to the phrases concerning the mission of German bayonets, which were to overthrow Russian Tsarism and free its oppressed peoples. The mighty sweep of the revolution in Russia, the profound results which have transformed all class relationships, raised all social and economic problems and, with the fatality of their own inner logic developed consistently from the first phase of the bourgeois republic to ever more advanced stages, finally reducing the fall of Tsarism to the status of a mere minor episode. All these things show as plain as day that the freeing of Russia was not an achievement of the war and the military defeat of Tsarism, not some service of German bayonets and German fists, as the new site under Kotsky's editorship once promised in an editorial. They show, on the contrary, that the freeing of Russia had its roots deep in the soil of its own land and was fully matured internally. The military adventure of German imperialism under the ideological blessing of German social democracy did not bring about the revolution in Russia, but only served to interrupt it at first, to postpone it for a while after its first stormy rising tide in the years 1911 to 13, and then after its outbreak created for it the most difficult and abnormal conditions. Moreover, for every thinking observer, these developments are a decisive refutation of the doctrinaire theory which Kotsky shared with the government social democrats, according to which Russia, as an economically backward and predominantly agrarian land, was supposed not to be ripe for social revolution and proletarian dictatorship. This theory, which regards only a bourgeois revolution as feasible in Russia, is also the theory of the opportunist wing of the Russian labor movement, of the so-called Mensheviks, under the experienced leadership of Axelrod and Dan. And from this conception follow the, the tactics of the coalition of socialists in Russia with bourgeois liberalism. On this basic conception of the Russian Revolution, from which follow automatically their detailed positions on questions of tactics, both the Russian and the German opportunists find themselves in agreement with the German government socialists. According to the opinion of all three, the Russian Revolution should have called a halt at the stage which German imperialism in its conduct of the war had set as its noble task, according to the mythology of the German social democracy i.e. it should have stopped with the overthrow of Tsarism. According to this view, if the revolution has gone beyond that point and has set as its task the dictatorship of the proletariat, this is simply a mistake of the radical wing of the Russian labor movement, the Bolsheviks. In all difficulties which the revolution has met with in its further course and all disorders it has suffered are pictured as purely a result of this fateful error. Theoretically, this doctrine, recommended as the fruit of Marxist thinking by the vorwarts of Stamfer and by Kotsky alike, follows from the original Marxist discovery that the socialist revolution is a national and, so to speak, a domestic affair in each modern country taken by itself. Of course, in the blue mists of abstract formulae, a Kotsky knows very well how to trace the worldwide connections of capital which make of all modern countries a single integrated organi organism. The problems of the Russian Revolution, moreover, since it is a product of international developments, plus the agrarian question, cannot possibly be solved within the limits of bourgeois society. Practically, the same doctrine represents an attempt to get rid of any responsibility for the course of the Russian Revolution, so far as that responsibility concerns the international, and especially the German proletariat, and to deny the international connections of this revolution. 
It is not Russia's unrightness which has been proved by the events of the war and the Ruff Russian Revolution, but the unripeness of the German proletariat for the fulfillment of its historic tasks. And to make this fully clear is the first task of a critical examination of the Russian Revolution. <clears throat> the fate of the revolution in Russia depended fully upon international events. That the Bolsheviks have based their policy entirely upon the world proletarian revolution is the clearest proof of their political farsightedness and firmness of principle and of the bold scope of their policies. In it is visible the mighty advance which capitalist development has made in the last decade. The revolution of 1905-07 to roused only a faint echo in Europe. Therefore, it had to remain a mere opening chapter. Continuation and conclusion were tied up with the further development of Europe. Clearly, not uncritical about apologetics, but penetrating and thoughtful criticism is alone capable of bringing out treasures of experiences and teachings. Dealing as we are with the very first experiment in proletarian dictatorship in world history, and one taking place at that under the hardest conceivable conditions in the midst of the worldwide conf conflagration and chaos of the imperialist mass slaughter caught in the coils of the most reactionary military power in Europe and accompanied by the most complete failure on the part of the international working class. It would be a crazy idea to think that every last thing done or left undone in an experiment with the dictatorship of the proletariat under such abnormal conditions represented the very pinnacle of perfection. On the contrary, elementary conceptions of socialist politics and an insight into their historically necessary prerequisites force us to understand that under such fatal conditions, even the most gigantic idealism and the most storm-tested revolutionary energy are incapable of realizing democracy and socialism, but only distorted attempts at either. To make this stand out clearly in all its fundamental aspects and consequences is the elementary duty of the socialists of all countries. For only on the background of this bitter knowledge can we measure the enormous magnitude of the responsibility of the international proletariat itself for the fate of the Russian Revolution. Furthermore, it is only on this basis that the decisive importance of the resolute international action of the proletariat can become effective without which action as its necessary support, even the greatest energy and the greatest sacrifices of the proletariat in a single country must inevitably become tangled in a maze of contradictions and blunders. There is no doubt either that the wise heads of, at the helm of the Russian Revolution, that Lenin and Trotsky on their thorny path, beset by traps of all kinds, have taken many a decisive step only with the greatest inner hesitation and with the most violent inner opposition. And surely nothing can be farther from their thoughts than to believe that all the things they have done or left undone under the conditions of bitter compulsion and necessity in the midst of the roaring whirlpool of events should be regarded by the international as a shining example of socialist polity toward which only uncritical admiration and zealous imitation are in order. It would be no less wrong to fear that a critical examination of the road so far taken by the Russian Revolution would serve to weaken the respect for and the attractive power of the example of the Russian Revolution, which alone can over overcome the fatal inertia of the German masses. Nothing is farther from the truth. An awakening of the revolutionary energy of the working class in Germany can never again be called forth in the spirit of the guardianship methods of the German social democracy of late lamented memory. It can never again be conjured forth by any spotless authority, be it that of our own higher committees or that of the Russian example. Not by the creation of a revolutionary hurrah spirit, but quite the contrary, only by an insight into all the fearful seriousness, all the complexity of the tasks involved, only as a result of political maturity and independence of spirit, only as a result of a capacity for critical judgment on the part of the masses, whose capacity was systematically killed by the social democracy for decades under various pretexts, only thus can the genuine capacity for historical action be born in the German proletariat. 
To concern one's self with a critical analysis of the Russian Revolution and all its historical connections is the best training for the German and the international working class for the tasks which confront them as an outgrowth of the present situation. The first period of the Russian Revolution from its beginning in March to the October Revolution corresponds exactly in its general outlines to the course of development of both the Great English Revolution and the Great French Revolution. It is the typical course of every first general reckoning of the revolutionary forces begotten within the womb of bourgeois society. Its development moves naturally in an ascending line from moderate beginnings to ever greater radicalization of aims and parallel with that from a coalition of classes and parties to the sole rule of the radical party. At the outset in March 1917, the cadets, that is the liberal bourgeoisie, stood at the head of the revolution. The first general rising of the revolutionary tide swept everyone and everything along with it. The fourth Duma, ultra-reactionary product of the ultra-reactionary four-class right of suffrage and arising out of the coup d'etat, was suddenly converted into an organ of the revolution. All bourgeois parties, even those of the nationalistic right, suddenly formed a phalanx against absolutism. The latter fell at the first attack almost without a struggle, like an organ that had died and needed only to be touched to drop off. The brief effort, too, of the liberal bourgeoisie to save at least the throne and the dynasty collapsed within a few hours. The sweeping march of events leaped in days and hours over distances that formerly in France took decades to traverse. In this, it became clear that Russia was realizing the result of a century of European development, and above all, that the revolution of 1917 was a direct continuation of that of 1905-07, and not a gift of the German liberator. The movement of March 1917 linked itself directly onto the point where, Ten years later, its work had broken off. The Democratic Republic was the complete, internally ripened product of the, of the very onset of revolution, of the revolution. Now, however, began the second and more difficult task. From the very first moment, the driving force of the revolution was the mass of the urban proletariat. However, its demands did not limit themselves to the realization of political democracy, but were concerned with the burning question of international policy, immediate peace. At the same time, the revolution embraced the mass of the army, which raised the same demand for immediate peace and the mass of the peasants, who pushed the agrarian question into the foreground, that agrarian question which since 1905 had been the very axis of the revolution. Immediate peace in land. From these two aims, the internal split in the revolutionary phalanx followed inevitably. The demand for immediate peace was in most irreconcilable opposition to the imperialist tendencies of the liberal bourgeoisie for whom Milyukov was the spokesman. On the other hand, the land question was a terrifying specter for the other wing of the bourgeoisie, the rural landowners. And, in addition, it represented an attack on the sacred principle of private property in general, a touchy point for the entire property class. Thus, on the very day after the first victories of the revolution, there began an inner struggle within it over the two, over the two burning questions, peace and land. The liberal bourgeoisie entered upon the tactics of dragging out things and evading them, the laboring masses, the army, the peasantry pressed forward ever more imp impetuously. There can be no doubt that with the questions of peace and land, the fate of the political democracy of the Republic was linked up. The bourgeois classes carried away by the first stormy wave of the revolution had permitted themselves to be dragged along to the point of Republican government. Now they began to seek a base of support in the rear and silently to organize a counter-revolution. The Kaledin Cossack campaign against Petersburg was a clear expression of this tendency. Had the attack been successful, then not only the fate of the, of the peace and land questions would have been sealed, but the fate of the Republic as well. 
military dictatorship a reign of terror against the proletariat and then return to monarchy would have been the inevitable results. From this, we can judge the utopian and fundamentally reactionary characters of the tactics by which the Russian Kotskians or Mensheviks permitted themselves to be guided. Hardened in their addiction to the myth of the bourgeois character of the Russian Revolution. For the time being, you see, Russia is not supposed to be right for the social revolution. They clung desperately to a coalition with the bourgeois liberals. But this means a union of elements which had been split by the natural internal development of the revolution and had come into the sharpest conflict with each other. The axle rods and dance wanted to collaborate at all, at all costs with those classes and parties from which came the greatest threat of danger to the revolution and to its first conquest, democracy. It is especially astonishing to observe how this industrious man, Kotsky, by his tireless labor of peaceful and method methodical writing during the four years of the World War, has torn one hole after another in the fabric of socialism. It is a labor from which socialism emerges riddled like a sieve, without a whole spot left in it. The uncritical indifference with which his followers regarded this industrious labor of their official theoretician and swallow each of his new discoveries without so much as batting an eyelash finds its only counterpart in the indifference with which the followers of Scheidemann and company look on while the latter punch socialism full of holes in practice. Inclined or inclined indeed, the two labors completely supplement each other. Since the outbreak of the war, Kotsky, the official guardian of the Temple of Marxism, has really only been doing in theory the same things which the Scheidemans have been doing in practice. Namely, one, the international an instrument of peace. Two, disarmament, the League of Nations and nationalism. And finally, three, democracy, not socialism. In this situation, the Bolshevik tendency performs the historic period of having proclaimed from the very beginning and having followed with iron consistency those tactics which alone could save democracy and drive the revolution ahead. All power exclusively in the hands of the worker and peasant masses, in the hands of the Soviets, this was indeed the only way out of the difficulty into which the revolution had gotten. This was the sword stroke with which they cut the the Gordian knot freed the revolution from a narrow blind alley and opened up for it an untrammeled path into the free and open fields. The party of Lenin was thus the only one in Russia which grasped the true interest of the revolution in that first period. It was the element that drove the revolution forward, and thus it was the only party which really carried on a socialist policy. It is this which makes clear too why it was that the Bolsheviks, though they were at the beginning of the revolution, a persecuted, slandered, and hunted minority attacked on all sides, arrived with the shortest time to the head of the revolution, and were able to bring under their banner all the genuine masses of the people, the urban proletariat, the army, the peasants, as well as the revolutionary elements of democracy, the left wing of the socialist revolutionaries. The real situation in which the Russian Revolution found itself narrowed down in a few months to the alternative, victory of the counter-revolution or dictatorship of the proletariat, Kaledin or Lenin. Such was the objective situation, just as it quickly presents itself in every revolution after the first intoxication is over, and as it presented itself in Russia as a result of the concrete, burning questions of peace and land for which there was no solution within the framework of bourgeois revolution. In this, the Russian Revolution has but confirmed the basic lesson of every great revolution, the law of its being, which decrees either the revolution must advance at a rapid, stormy, resolute tempo, break down all barriers with an iron hand and place its goals even farther ahead, or it is quite soon thrown backward behind its feeble point of departure and suppressed by counter-revolution. To, to stand still, to mark time on one spot, to be contented with the first goal it happens to reach, 
is never possible in revolution, and he who tries to apply the homemade wisdom derived from parliamentary battles between frogs and mice to the field of revolutionary tactics only shows thereby that the very psychology and laws of existence of revolution are alien to him and that all historical experience is to him a book sealed with seven seals. Take the course of the English Revolution from its onset in 1642. There, the logic of things made it necessary that the first feeble vacillations of the Presbyterians, whose leaders deliberately evaded a decisive battle with Charles I and victory over him, should inevitably be replaced by the independents who drove them out of Parliament and seized the power for themselves. And in the same way, within the army of the independents, the lower petty bourgeois mass of the soldiers, the Lilburnian levelers, constituted the driving force of the entire independent movement, just as, finally, the proletarian elements within the mass of the soldiers, the elements that weren't farthest in their aspirations for social revolution and who found their expression in the digger movement, constituted in their turn the leave the leaven of the Democratic Party of the Levelers. Without the moral influence of the revolutionary proletarian elements on the general mass of the soldiers, without the pressure of the democratic mass of the soldiers upon the bourgeois upper layers of the party of the independents, there would have been no purge of the long parliament of its, Presbyterian, of its Presbyterians, nor any victorious ending to the war with the army of the Cavaliers and Scots, or any trial and execution of Charles I, nor any abolition of the House of Lords and proclamation of a republic. And what happened in the great French Revolution? Here, after four years of struggle, the seizure of power by the Jacobins proved to be the only means of saving the conquests of the revolution, of achieving a republic, of smashing feudalism, of organizing a revolutionary defense against inner as well as outer foes, of suppressing the conspiracies of counter-revolution and spreading its revolutionary wave from France to all Europe. Kotsky and his Russian co-religionists who wanted to see the Russian Revolution keep the bourgeois character of its first phase are an exact, exact counterpart of those German and English liberals of the preceding century who distinguished between the two well-known periods of the great French Revolution, the good revolution of the first Girondin phase and the bad one after the Jacobins, Jacobin uprising. The liberal shallowness of this conception of history, to be sure, doesn't care to understand that without the uprising of the immoderate Jacobins, even the first timid and half-hearted achievements of the Girondin phase would soon have been buried under the ruins of the revolution and that the real alternative to Jacobin dictatorship, as the iron course of historical development posed the question in 1793, was not moderate democracy, but restoration of the Bourbons. The golden mean cannot be maintained in any revolution. The law of its nature demands a quick decision. Either the locomotive drives forward full steam ahead to the most extreme point of the historical ascent, or it rolls back of its own weight, again to the starting point at the bottom. And those who would keep it with their weak powers halfway up the hill, it drags down with it irredeemably into the abyss. Thus, it is clear that in every revolution, only that party capable of seizing the leadership and power which has the courage to issue the appropriate watchwords for driving the revolution ahead and the courage to draw all the necessary conclusions from the situation this makes clear, too, the miserable role of the Russian Mensheviks, the Dans, Zaratelis, etc., who had enormous influence on the masses at the beginning, but after their pro prolonged wavering and after they had fought with both hands and feet against taking over power and responsibility, were driven ignobly off the stage. The party of Lenin was the only one which grasped the mandate and duty of a truly revolutionary party, and which, by the slogan, all power in the hands of the proletariat and peasantry, ensured the continued development of the revolution. 
Thereby, the Bolsheviks solved the famous problem of winning a majority of the people, which problem has never weighed on the German social democracy like a nightmare. As bread in the bone disciples of parliamentary cretinism, these German social democrats have sought to apply to revolution the homemade wisdom of the parliamentary nursery. In order to carry anything, you must first have a majority. The same, they say, applies to a revolution. First, let's become a majority. The true dialectic of revolutions, however, stands with wisdom or stands this wisdom of parliamentary moles on its head, not through a majority, but through revolutionary tactics to a majority. That's the way the road runs. Only a party which knows how to lead, that is to advance things, wins support in stormy times. The determina determination with which at the decisive moment, Lenin and his comrades offered the only solution which could advance things, all power in the hands of the proletariat and peasantry, transformed them almost overnight from a persecuted, slandered, outlawed minority whose leader had to hide like Marat in cellars into the absolute master of the situation. Moreover, the Bolsheviks immediately set as the aim of the seizure of power a complete, far-reaching revolutionary program not the safeguarding of bourgeois democracy, but a dictatorship of the proletariat for the purpose of realizing socialism. Thereby, they won for themselves the imperishable historic distinction of having for the first time proclaimed the final aim of socialism as the direct program of practical politics. Whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness and consistency in an historic hour Lenin, Trotsky, and all the other comrades had given in good measure. All the revolutionary honor and capacity which Western social democracy lacked was represented by the Bolsheviks. Their October uprising was not only the actual salvation of the Russian Revolution, it was also the salvation of the honor of international socialism.